We welcome you to worship today. We're so happy that we are all together in worship, especially if you're a guest with us. We're so thrilled that you're together with us. And let's remember that we are all together, united as one in our worship today. I'm beginning my sermon on the, what makes to the, for the front porch in my house. It's really a stoop, if you will. I wish I had a great big front porch to sit out on. And I'm here because a number of years ago, I read an article in a small town daily newspaper where my father was the editor. It was a humor column that made this speculation that the reason that participation in democracy in our country has gone down as measured by the declining percentage of people voting is because not as many houses have front porches anymore. Because back in the day when many houses had front porches, people sat out on those porches and it led to conversations with their neighbors and friends. Imagine you're sitting out on your front porch and your neighbor walks by and you start talking because you're accessible. You're not in your backyard living space or patio. And eventually your neighbor's sitting with you on the porch and you're talking leads to a discussion on politics because your neighbor has a different political viewpoint than you do, votes for different candidates than you do. And as often as the case with political discussion, it gets a little animated and you're more motivated, therefore, to want to participate in the political process. At least vote to cancel out your neighbor's vote. And this article speculated in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way that this is the reason that participation in elections has gone down because not as many front porches where you can have easy discussions with people. Now we could say that maybe our social media has taken the place of our front porches, but I don't think that's nearly as good an exchange. You can't engage face to face in a give and take dialogue there. But I'm out here on my front porch with that in mind because today we're concluding our series titled Talking Points, The Perfect Blend of Politics and Religion. A series by the same title written by Andy Stanley, Pastor Andy Stanley, is what we're borrowing from very often for this series. I want you to look at the photograph that hopefully is showing up on the screen right now. This is a computer-generated photograph done by an artist who plugged in data into a artificial intelligence program to generate what he imagined Jesus looked like. Using the ethnicity and background of Jesus as far as we know. Now, I don't know if this is really what Jesus looked like, but I posted this on my social media a few weeks ago and I got a whole range of reactions. One person thought it looked like the Chechen terrorist who set off a bomb at the Boston Marathon. Another thought he looked like Colin Kaepernick. One person whose reaction I most appreciated began by saying, Jesus, forgive me, which is a wonderful way to begin most any political discussion. Jesus, forgive me for what's about to happen. Jesus, forgive me. And the person went on to say, my first thought is enemy. Now, there were other reactions. Some people appreciated, liked it. One person thought it was reasonable. Another person thought I might anger some by posting this. But you had reaction to the photograph and then reactions to the reactions and reactions to the reactions. You know how that works. Often is the case in political discussions. Let me ask you, have you seen videos or photographs on the news of people that seem different from you? doing things that you dislike or you don't understand or you dis disagree with and it stirred up a negative reaction in you? I know I have. I've seen photographs, people demonstrating at the state house, and it stirs up a negative reaction in me. You see, whether we like it or not, whether we're comfortable with it or not, we are now living in an America that is increasingly diverse. Racially, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, politics, just to name a few. Now, we've probably been more diverse in the past than we were willing to understand. But it's increasing. At least it seems that way. There's an often quoted statistic that says by the year 2045, less than 50% of the people living in the United States 
will identify as white. Now, whether that's true or not, I think we all can agree, it seems at least, that our diversity is increasing. And that's certainly true when it comes to our political diversity. We have growing political differences. Even within political parties, they seem more divided than they did in the past. Nothing divides like politics because nothing divides like fear. I said that a couple weeks ago. And fear often is animated our politics. If the other party wins, if the other candidate is elected, then something's going to be taken away from us. And we're afraid of that. And this growing political division is broadening, but it's also deepening, even within some of our primary relationships of our close friends or our family even. And it's therefore causing pain in people's life and discomfort and confusion. And that's why we thought it was important to address this in this series that we're concluding today. But given the depth and breadth of our political differences, can there really be a perfect blend of politics and religion? I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not My failures I try to hide. You was my dream till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave.
invite us to again sit at the kitchen table and continue our discussion about whether it's possible to have a perfect blend of politics and religion. I'll let you decide whether what we're teaching here gets us to that goal or not. I've heard some say that they didn't think this sermon series was as controversial as they would imagine it would have been. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing, but again, I'll let you decide. Last week, Pastor Mike referred to Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, which is a very helpful verse as we try to imagine how it is that you have a perfect blend of politics and religion. It says in that passage this, Carry each other's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What does that mean? Well, on one hand, I think it means to care for each other's physical needs. People are poor or hungry or such. But when it comes to imagining how it is we can have a perfect blend of politics and religion, I think it also means this. When we choose to carry someone's burdens, we listen learn, and lean in. When we are disagreeing politically with someone, if we're going to carry their burdens, the burdens of their political viewpoint, the burdens of their passions that they have for the way the world should be, we first listen. We listen more and we talk less. We give them the grace of listening to why they believe and vote the way they do. And as we listen to them, we begin to learn and we begin to understand what it is that led them to those decisions. And then we continue to lean into those relationships. Even if we learn that the differences between us are less than we thought they were, or more than they, we thought they were as we listen and learn, we continue to lean into those relationships. We don't cut them off because we disagree politically. That's what it means to love unconditionally. And this way, I think we begin to have more a perfect blend of politics and religion. We, we put our faith filter ahead of our political filter because Jesus would have us love unconditionally even those that we disagree with politically. And the results of this is that the mission of our King Jesus grows. Let me give you one illustration of this. By all measurements of people that do this kind of analysis of the Christian culture in our country, by all measurements, the participation of young adults in Christian communities is dropping dramatically, starkly. It, it, Everywhere I read, I, I see that being said, which, of course, is extremely troubling because I have four children in that age group. Now, I was with them on vacation uh, uh, during the summer, and we're sitting around the campfire with my adult children and their spouses, and so I took the opportunity to ask them this question. What do they think the barriers are to people in their generation to getting connected with a Christian community, a faith community, to open themselves up to consider who Jesus is. And almost with one voice, immediately, they all said the same thing in a way that caught me off guard. They said this, the biggest barrier to faith among their generation is the perception that the Christian church in America has aligned itself with political parties. They went on to say that many people in their generation see this as hypocritical and causing even greater division. And that's why people are turning away, and people that age are turning away from the message of the church or what we're teaching. Now, all my kids are involved with churches and I'm thankful for that, but that's what they reported among what they hear from people their age. Now, we might respond to that, in a way we're saying, well, you know, we need to take a stand on issues that are important to us. And maybe we it even grows to the point where we can't understand how a follower of Jesus can have a different viewpoint on an issue that's important to us. And our viewpoint lines up with 
or aligns more with a particular candidate or a particular party. And therefore, we might even take the step to say, well, of course, the church should align itself with a political party or candidate because it aligns with our viewpoints on this important issue. And yet what my adult children told me and what I've heard from others as well in that age group is that this is what's turning off many young adults to the church and the message that we have of who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. I think we get off track and we hurt the mission of, of Christ by trying to connect it so closely with a political viewpoint. Because here's the thing. Jesus did not come to be the spiritual support for a political platform. He didn't come to be the footnote in a political platform's agenda. Or to say it another way, uh, Tony Evans said this, Pastor Tony Evans, Jesus didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. Our message, which is was the message of the early church, the people who were closest to Jesus, the ones who walked with him and were taught by him, the message is that Jesus our King came not to take sides, but to take over and make all things new. This is the good news that changed the ancient Roman, Greco-Roman world and changed Western culture. And I think when we edit this message to try to fit it into our political platform, we rob the world of this world-changing message that Jesus is the king that came to make all things new. So the question is this, are you putting your political filter ahead of your faith filter and therefore blunting the truth that Jesus came to make all things new and in this way, possibly turning others away from considering who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish? Good morning. I invite you to get out your Bibles and turn to our lesson today from Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you, all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the word of our Lord. If we're going to move towards understanding and experiencing a perfect blend of politics and religion, these words that we just read from the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians can be helpful to us. When he says that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, we that may seem self-evident to us now, because we've had many centuries of understanding this teaching of the New Testament. But in the days that Paul wrote this, this was incredibly disruptive to the culture. Because while there was a lot of diversity in the culture, just as there is in our day, being really unified in that diversity was not such a common thing. The earliest followers of Jesus began to reshape what became the Western world, the Western culture, because of what we might call culturally disruptive unity. Because in the early church, there were classes of people whose circles rarely overlapped, who came together voluntarily and regularly to worship 
the crucified God, Jesus. This was appalling to many people in that culture on many levels. But the early followers of Jesus did this because this is what Jesus taught them to do. That he was coming to make all things new. That King Jesus was coming to establish a new kingdom where everyone would be invited. And when the Apostle Paul writes these words, and they may be kind of self-evident to us now because we've had so many centuries to think about them and ingest them. In Paul's day, these distinctions, Jew versus Gentile, slave versus free, male versus female, those were hard and fast distinctions. Those were lines that you didn't blur. And yet, Christianity achieved what may have seemed impossible in the day. That the teachings of Jesus elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master and commoner and nobleman and male and female and Jew and Gentile alike on the same station before God, that we all are sinful and fall short of the glory of God, regardless of who we are or where we are born and what our ethnicity was. And this was world changing. This new way of looking at others, this new kingdom of God, at the beginning it struck many in that ancient culture as appalling. And then it began to become appealing. And then it became contagious. And my dear ones, every Christ follower since then, including us, is a part of this world-changing, culturally disruptive, unifying movement. Why would we allow ourselves now to be so divided over party lines, knowing that one day those parties are gone, but the kingdom of Jesus remains. What we're teaching here is, is not that we should not have political differences. That's just not possible. What we're teaching is that even within our political differences, we can have a unity that overcomes those differences, that, that sees those differences in the context of what's most important. We are being divided over important issues, issues that we are passionate about. And it may be impossible for you to understand how a follower of Jesus could possibly have a different view on a specific issue that's important. And so what I want to say is when you go to vote, vote your law of Christ as it has informed your conscience. Vote the law of Christ as it has informed your conscience. You don't vote, vote based on trying to make other people happy. Vote your conscience and vote. That's important. But between now and election day, and especially after this election, let's do what the earliest Christians did. Let's change the world. Let's carry each other's burdens by listening and learning and leaning in so that we can understand where we each are and consequently where we stand. We may never agree politically, but we can love unconditionally because we will gain an understanding of each other. We will do what is the most important thing, to carry each other's burdens and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. You do not have to understand me or agree with me to love me. And I don't need to understand or agree with you 
to love you. 2020 continues to be so disruptive in our lives. The pandemic, the social unrest over racial tensions, this election and now locally, uh, this strike that's going on in Gehenna schools. But dear ones, this is the time. This is the opportunity when we see whether or not we have the mind of Christ within us. We can disagree on many issues, but we can love unconditionally and we can pray that God would make us one so that we can influence many. Let's do this. Let's not miss this opportunity. And together we can make our towns, our communities, our nation, in our world better. One is better. And we can disagree politically and yet love unconditionally. And that will make a great difference in what our culture is experiencing today. God be with you and God is in you. We are the change the world is waiting for. We've got to love the world is desperate for. We will lead and take to your streets. Now's the time for us to rise and care. And let love shine and show this world that mercy is alive. And now's the time for us to rise and carry hope to hopeless eyes and show this world that mercy is alive. We're not afraid.
Now's the time for us to rise and carry hope and let love shine and show this world that mercy is alive. And now's the time for us to rise and carry hope to hopeless eyes and show this world that mercy is alive. As members of the body of Christ gathered here and across the world, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Merciful God, we pray for the entire church, your holy and apostolic church, where it is in error, reform it, where the church speaks truth, strengthen it, where the church is divided, bring us together and unify it. Empower and strengthen us with your Holy Spirit that we may boldly proclaim the liberating good news of your unconditional love in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all creation, renew and inspire leaders of every walk of life so that we may work together for the well-being of all people created in your image. In a world suffering from conflict and division. Guide us to be peacemakers and agents of grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of reconciliation and peace, bring wisdom, new ideas, peace, and a better way forward for the Gehenna schools, administration, and teachers. Bless all, including families and students, with patience and peace as negotiations continue. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, restore and renew all those wrestling with doubt, pain, or addiction. Give your healing touch to all whose sighs are too deep for words and who's those who are ill. Especially, we pray for Bob Bone, Don and Joy Bowersox, Angela Brinkman. We pray, Lord, for Jan Dixon, Mark Grants, Dale Grillo, for Les and Terry Haley, Don Clamfoot, Jerry Lammers, and Christy Jensen. For Pam Madden, Michael Genevieve, and Colin Richard, Ashley Romito, Charlotte Seacrest, Mindy Spro, Amy Themans, Ronna Deb Whitman. For the family and friends of Romella Waldvogel. And for all widows and those in grief. Empower us to meet the days ahead with courage and a life-giving faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Spirit, intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. Keep us in true faith and gather us with the whole church on earth into the communion of the triune God, in whose name we pray, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Again, we are so happy that you can be with us for worship today. Please take a moment, fill out the connection card, and share your offering with us. We thank you very much for both. So just a few announcements for our time together today. First, we have set November 1st as our first Sunday back in the building for worship. Traditional worship will be held at 8.30 a.m. and contemporary worship at 10.30 a.m., both services will be in the fellowship hall to allow more people to worship while physically distant. Uh, reservations and face coverings will be required. Both services will be live streamed to allow you to worship from home. Second, October 30th, 30 groups and 30 bags of candy. So first, October 30th, 
That's our fall, family fall festival. It's a Friday, and that festival is coming up at 6 p.m. on the 30th. We are, have 30 groups. Space is limited to 30 groups, so register today. And you can register using the link on our website at stlukecolumbus.com. And 30 bags of candy. We're in need of candy donations for that event. 30 bags worth for that evening. So sign up online to let us know you are able to donate candy. Thank you in advance for that. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And this year, St. Luke is participating in a month-long fundraiser to support LSF's Choices, the only domestic violence shelter in Franklin County. You can give online directly to Choices using the link on our website or write a check to St. Luke and include Choices in the memo line. And lastly, we are seeking qualified applicants to become St. Luke's next part-time bookkeeper. Applicants are asked to submit a resume to St. Luke through regular mail or email at stlukecolumbus at gmail.com. In the meantime, please contact Pastor Steve if you have any questions. My friends, hear these words of blessing. Live with the sure and certain hope that you belong to the eternal kingdom of God, Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, we come to you this morning and we sing praises with every ounce of breath we have because you are good. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to
go out in peace and live in unity through Christ. Thanks be to God. You're always speaking Just a word has the whole earth shaking Yes, our God cannot be moved In a world of hate and vengeance Your word speaks of forgiveness Yes, our God